Welcome. This is the September 28th Beehive call. We have John D, Jan B, Andrew H, and his colleague Mark G, and myself, Michael D. And let's see, there are a few items that are awaiting people, but I will throw in some news. One, the Euro Beehive con recording was not very good. There was a webcam in the corner. And if you're good at reading lips, I can post that. But otherwise, maybe I'll post some screenshots. No biggie. Uh, let's see. I do want to get into PRs. Jan, I noticed that as of yesterday, Bjorn Zeeb has not tickled the tap PR, unfortunately. He hasn't. He hasn't. And fortunately, the 9PFS uh, PR is getting a bunch of attention and Juniper finally shared their code. So there's some refactoring to be done. And Dave stepped in and made some comments, which is great. Um, I did try that Prosody a uh, panic issue and commented on my test last night. So I've reached out to the author asking if there was something you need a, unique about his configuration. And just yesterday, Goran gave an overview of his nifty jail and V list work. I've got a link in the doc if you care about such things, but also in exciting news, Peter Tribble, Tribble posted MVI, the minimal viable Illumos. And that is, is something he's been updating while well, he's been working on it for years, but he's been updating quite frantically to support Beehive. So you'll see commits from like 20 hours ago. The repo is in the dock. So Mark, G, welcome. It's been a while. I understand you have some vagrant news. Uh, more that I have just uh, refactored. Well, uh, previously I had only working with... Uh, with uh i'm sorry i wasn't quite prepared for the topic but uh i can give you a minute if you like but either way i had basically refactored a few different things uh basically i since uh don't add them on the lumos versions they auto create the nix uh if you spec specify them in the zone configs i've uh have the nix auto creating i have a few other things uh in regards to how it interacts with omni os on the first time it, it boots uh, at first time it tries to log in and configure it uh, since there isn't a native like uh, VirtualBox guest controls I have to use a serial console basically and the Z login cons uh, serial console to access the machines um, so I've, I've kind of worked on that uh, to be a bit more what's the word I guess dynamics probably the best word here so um, okay. just some, some minor work um, but uh, the biggest thing I've been trying to work on question I've had is trying kind of working lately is hot mounting uh CFS data sets on beehive zones. So that's that's something uh we need to do for restores. So if anybody has any thoughts on that, I would much appreciate that once we get so to that's that. Specifically a zone or also a beehive branded zone? Uh anything that uses a Zval, um, but we mostly use beehive zones. Okay, so you're hoping to hot plug that Zvol to a Beehive instance under a zone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I don't. Uh, Andrew can speak more to this. Is, is Beehive on OmniOS under a zone itself, or is it just uh, the zone's just basically a wrapper over it, right? It's just a. It's just using it as a interface to control it. So it's an. It's basically just using it as an API. Yeah, I didn't know but if the Lumos zone was exactly zone the same thing as previous two single, times. Sorry. No, uh, yeah, I wasn't quite sure if previous D's version of zones is the same as Lumos's versions of zones. So I didn't know if that should, should be clarified or not there. Uh, they, they are quite different, but there has been progress on jailing uh, Beehive. You beat us to it. Um, that said, well, I know we've got some no, I don't... storage options on FreeBSD, but I'm not sure on... Lumos. Uh, I wonder if the oxide work has produced anything along those lines. Familiar with that? Uh, that would. You are familiar or not familiar? I am not. Ah, then look for Propolis from Patrick Mooney. Does. Uh, let 
Let's see if I can find you a link. GitHub PF Mooney. Yes. He's been doing full time Illumos uh, beehive work for quite some time, and we thank him for it. It's just of 20 hours ago. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so here's that. Uh, I'll put the link here and in the chat. So indeed, I see he's got propolis from oxide working on a few things as of indeed 20 hours ago. Um, and he is rather accessible through be it IRC or otherwise. They may just want to drop him a line. Um, do a quick look at the page. No, I don't see anything explicitly, explicitly about storage, but uh, that doesn't mean it's not there. So anyway, that's the Propolis page. Thank you for giving me a thread to pull on. My pleasure. And again, check Beehive IRC on, what is it? Um, the new one. Uh, oh, I'm not even logged in on this new machine. Anyway, uh, so what guests do you support on Vagrant under uh, OmniOS at this point? Uh, so we support OmniOS as a guest. So we support Debian, Ubuntu, Windows 2022, 2019, 2012. I mean, we I don't have a lot of images for, for a lot of the Windows things, but mm -hmm. it, once the image is made, it supports it. Um, for Windows, it uses for the configuration, the special administrative console, the SAC serial console. For Linux, it uses just a standard serial console. For OmniOS, it uses the, um, not the standard console, but the virtual consoles that it comes during the installation. I I, the, I, could, I don't know much about them. Um, and I have been working, I have a template in the works for Arch, and I have um, uh, some workings on uh, PFSense, and that kind of is in tandem with uh, the BSDs there. So... I'm getting close to getting a lot of the OS, major OSs. Um, so I'm, I, I, the last couple of them are, are more future work in the next couple of months, hopefully. So that is cool. Are, are you, could you post your link, which I know is in the docs? And that's a whole different topic of how to archive these docs for easy searching, but that's a separate orthogonal topic. Um, for Windows, do you start with an ISO or a VM image or something else entirely? So since uh, so I use the Vagrant app cloud for all of my box files that I store all my Vagrant files that the packer makes for them. Um, since you can't really share Windows images, I don't have one public for Windows, so you're going to have to make your own. Um, the way you can really make your own is just basically create a VirtualBox machine using Windows and install the Vert.io drivers for the, your version oh, of Windows. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the, the default Windows things there. Um, once you do yeah. that, then you convert the VDI to a ZVol, um, on onto a Beehive host and then configure your Beehive configurations to use that as a boot volume. Once the boot volume is up, reconfigure as you need for a, a, as a template and then snapshot it. And then what I do is for the app cloud, instead of putting it into like a, uh, I don't know what format it is, since it's a ZVOL, I save it as a ZFS snapshot. So I call it a ZSS file. Mm -hmm. um, and then I tar the ZSS file up with metadata into a dot box file and upload that to the Vagrant cloud. And then I can just Vagrant, um, Vagrant up and it downloads the box from any machine that I use. Nice. Uh... Yeah, I guess Windows will always be like that. Unless so, they have yeah, everything it's, in within the Azure okay. ecosystem. But yeah, but basically, once you've created the, the 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 box file and you have it, you can include that box file and like does it on a template on a host and call it statically instead of from a URL. So, if you have your own Windows template, you can do that. I don't. I have support for ISOs. Um, yes. That that's that's not really a packer or a vagrant thing, anyways. Starting with ISOs. But given that you can, even if I think it requires a browser interaction, you can legally download the Windows installer ISOs. Um, so you can automate it. You just have to fetch the installer once and you can't share that part. But the build instructions should be shareable, right? 
Yeah, all, the, all that's all is shareable, and it's in. Oh well, I have some instructions. I haven't really got got. I've documented more to the program of Vagrant Zones than than I have actually documented how to set up a VM. Um, that that is something I'll I'll note to add to the wikis and documentation. That's a, that's a good point. Given the state of um, Beehive's VNC service, which in my opinion is uh, just good enough for um, doing a manual installation of a graphical operating system before you install something inside the guest, uh, it would be quite nice to have something to just basically install Windows, provision an initial account, and uh, enable the RDP service. Mm -hmm. Because once you have RDP, it's a lot more user friendly. And then you can use Ansible and all sorts of other things to connect no, to it and do things. No, because it provides a snap user interface, shared directories, uh, share um, audio connection to the guest, and so on. Right. Yeah. So, um, in in regards to Windows, it's because I'm afraid of the legal implications, I don't have any images, but I, I'm more than happy to show you how to build build them because that's not something that's legal. So right, that is legal, the but, uh, uh, that's right uh, word. Yeah. General fact about it. <laughs> so you can't derive anything from you can't share anything derived of the installers. And from the chat, is this the correct link to your work? I'm pulling that from a previous. I am trying to, I lost where I had the Google page at right now. So I'm just trying to type it in there Appreciate for you. But, but yeah, uh, that that's a uh, vagrant zone, uh, here. Yeah. Nope. Nope, Is exactly. that where you wanted it? Yep. Oh, uh, sure. That's okay. Great. Um, does that cover Windows uh, steps? There's some of that in my future, whether I like it or not. Um. I, I mean, yeah, I can add that to the list. Um, let me let me write down that I probably should do that sooner rather than later since there's interest. Cool. Yeah, there is. And I'm curious, I assume Vagrant is doing this in every which way for other OSs. What has it, this been largely you porting it to OmniOS and needing to adjust in consistently somewhere? So well, really leveraging the heck out of upstream? So most of it is that we uh, about four years ago had somebody uh, port Vagrant, the, the Ruby version of it, or yeah, I think it was a Ruby version of it, um, over to to uh, to work on uh, OmniOS. We got that done. The next part was to then create a plugin that would manage specifically zones because um, Vagrant itself doesn't handle like. Providers, unless you give it like a, a like a there's the VMware plugin, there's the VirtualBox plugin, there's the uh, Vert, uh, LiveVirt plugin. So the different ways to manage the different hypervisors, there's there's plugins for them. Okay. So there we, there have been a couple of zone plugins for Beehive and LX stuff, but they're all very very out of date and they just didn't work for me. Okay. Um, so we had I had we had initially worked with somebody to start uh, start us on a LX zone plugin as a base template, and then from the two two or three dot RB files that they gave us, I ended up with some complex beast that can now basically spin up a, a Beehive machine like it would a VirtualBox machine on OmniOS um, for the OSs that I described as above. The biggest issue is really that I don't have a guest control or an API mechanism to really say, hey, what are you? Okay, you're this, can you do this? And I don't really have a good way of doing that other than through serial and using basically a lot of uh, pseudo consoles. Interesting. So that that right now is, so every machine has to have serial enabled as the base, as the base uh, template. Uh, otherwise I can't really set them up unless it's using DHCP, which is, I have support for that, and OmniOS Zone has support for cloud in it. Um, and I do have some. I used to have it working. I haven't checked the the code path lately, so it could be stale on right. the cloud in it stuff. But I, I I couldn't think of a better way without some. If someone ever finds a good way for uh, like VBox guest desk tools inside of the Beehive Zone, let me know because that would be wonderful to be able to create that information. 
I mean, as long as we don't have a tool package, I can't think of anything directly like that. The best thing I could think of is we could put like a custom tag to indicate what it is. Well, I mean, I already have the information in the metadata if someone's using the Vagrant box file that I created. But the problem that we mentioned earlier is the Windows box files, I can't share anything derived from the ISO, and those box files are. Um, so I'd only be able to just share the build instructions. Um, so it would take away the point of automating it, since I wouldn't be able to necessarily share the part of the code that allows it to do that. I mean, they would be able to set it up themselves and automate, I guess, privately. But yeah. Jan, do you have a, a link for Configinit, which you say you are quite happy with? Yes, I use uh, Configinit too? for, yep. Uh, I use it for um, the Packer build side of it, actually. So with Packer, I have uh, tell it Grub, delete everything in the Grub config and tell it to use the CloudInit uh, URL and it uses the user data file. Once the user data files, I have it using encrypted ZFS uh, configurations right now on some machines and XFS and others. I have some pretty, I, I love CloudInit. CloudInit is, is the bee's knees. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, I'm not talking well, about CloudInit. Cloud in it. Configuring it, okay. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, I'm not familiar with Configuring it. I think in it by Colin Percival is basically the stripped down versions in let me check 50 lines of uh, portable shell code <laughs> what it does is it just takes a tarball goes through the files if it starts with a shebang it executes it if it starts with a uh, redirect it, it append uh, it redirects into the file if it starts with a append it appends to a file and anything else, it tries to unpack as a tarball and recurse into it. <laughs> so the script is really short enough that you don't even have to package it. I'm reading through the uh, the page here. I have you have a good link one. for it? Just drop that link in chat. If yeah, you yeah. Know. I have uh, the You've got, original you, link I've for got it. I've got yours, and... Jan. What about uh, Mark's uh, cloud in it? Oh. Yeah. How the networks on cool, Ubuntu, you. Uh, Ubuntu and CentOS uh, or Debian and CentOS derivatives, but Debian also prefers to use DebConf as well, so that's a little bit confusing. Yeah, you have to call into it, or else the next update may break things. I would second the cloud in it. We use it heavily. Yeah, it's the way most big hosters went, so it's. Where the mind shares. How's the Windows handling, if any? Okay. Uh, we're in it. Uh, I'm pretty sure most people set up Windows with uh, response files. Response files. So, okay. um, for the most part, unless you already have like a golden template that you have like uh, Ansible or Packer installed on it beforehand that it pulls configs when it booted up. Cool. I, I don't really know of any global system. That manages, I mean, I'm sure there are out there that manages all the OSs. Then, generally related, I'll say that I was surprised that FAI, the fully automatic install for Debian, uh, surprisingly, one has, I think it was Rocky, yeah, CentOS and Rocky support, plus Ubuntu, which I didn't know, and on the RAID map, they hope to do uh, ZFS. So that hopefully the ZFS aspect might get a little nudge from some folks I met at uh, UOBSDCon. But the Debian project is shipping official no cloud images, which I've been using to my liking. So there's that. Um, thank you for those links. And Curtin, who comes up with these names? They're worse than my project names. Okay, they're they're more clever. Than That's my button. Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu works with CloudInit, and CloudInit's like Curtin is Ubuntu spin on it because they've got to do their own spin. But um, it's basically the same thing. Got it. Read the docs. Okay. Uh, make a note here. 
Anything else on that topic, John? It sounds like you've got some insights. You're just seconding, and that's pretty much where you're at. In the configuration I use, users are given VMs, and when you do a rollback on them, it puts that the rollback goes to a cloud enabled version of the image, and the users uh, basically send in a uh, cloud init script to configure the system the way they want it. It hmm. keeps me out of it. Mm -hmm. Makes nice. it where if they needed multiple machines, they just copy the config and change the name, basically. Yeah, well, they can send the same cloud init into multiple systems. Um, I, for free, give them a DHCP with a host name, so their cloud init can actually put a, a simple case statement in there if they're using Bash to test the host name and do what they want. Cool. Um, any other thoughts on that topic? Any uh, you've touched on guest tools, which that's been an open topic for quite some time, but I don't know if we want to address it here. But as for the higher level provisioning, feel free to throw out any tips and ideas you have. But that's great feedback. And John, while we've got you, any uh, LibNFS news? Um, I believe last time we mentioned I'm working or we're working on some write. Um, that's about as far as we've gotten. I did post in the chat a indirectly related issue. I have a system with some Mellanox cards in it, and I was trying to use dev control to detach and attach the PPT driver, and it core dumped on me, which was not pleasant, and I popped a link to it in the chat. Uh, just one sec, I see it. And I haven't really had a chance to completely chase that down, but it does look like it's in our, in, um, it's not, doesn't appear to be in the driver, but I don't know that the driver isn't the cause of the problem. So, so it happens in the PCI IOV detach method, which is yes. kind of strange because why would the IOV driver detach when you are assigning the PPP, uh, so the dummy um, masking driver? Wouldn't it then attach? So but, I'm basically taking a uh, an MLX or a, a MCE driver at the host layer, and I am I'm detaching the MLX MCE driver and attaching PPT. And this is what happens. And I've been able to replicate it on all the various OS versions I've got. And both Intel and AMD, or only Intel? Well, if we go to AMD, that's a different story. Um, if you want to talk about that for a second. So I've just messaged Santiago to see if he can join because he's been struggling and ripping his hair out over uh, AMD IOMMU bugs yes. that appear to have exposed. And I think Jan, you had a moment to sit with him too. But John, let us um, let us hear your tale of woe, and we'll support it as we as, as uh, well. I in listening to the people on the list. Um, I tried to get my fingers on an AMD Epic system. Okay. And I I have. Okay. And I've been trying to actually just do an install on it, which I don't even have a working install yet. Um, the install disk uh, core dumps, kernel dumps, uh, when accessing the NVMe drives built into the system. So I have gone into the BIOS and disabled the NVMe drives, which has allowed it to boot. Um, and I am now trying to get a setup onto a pair of uh, Intel uh, SSDs to, and to see if I can get in and finish the installation. But that, that's as far as I am right now. OK. Uh, I'll disclose my hardware. You don't have to disclose yours. But on my HP, I think Gen 10 
7402P, I have the exact opposite problem. The NVM, the the uh, the low end SATA controller was panicking, but NVMe was fine, and I had to boot off of NVMe. I did see a a fix that someone posted, and is hopefully in in head in fourteen. So uh, that's a surprise. Can you at least give the brand name? It's, of that a, it's, a, it's a super micro system. It has ten. Uh, direct connect NVMe across the front of the box um, with two built-in Intel cards for the, you know, OS. Um, okay. Interesting. So, yeah, it was, I had a, exactly the opposite problem and hopefully that's resolved. I'll try to figure that out this week. I've gone, I have gone in and I've reset the bias. I've made sure everything is updated to the latest versions. I have uh, disabled their logical uh, processor option. I've disabled uh, the X2 Apex okay. stuff. Um, I disabled something else. I don't remember what it was right now. Uh, but again, I've, I've, I've gotten it to the point where I've been able to boot it to the installer. So now I'm trying to get a, uh, I'm actually trying to get an install to go. And there's another guy working on it. And I haven't heard back from him yet. Okay. Um. I don't know if I can find that ticket very easily, but I'm I, I'm appreciative of the reminder on that. And so it sounds like you haven't even gotten as far as the IOMMU. You're still setting up the system, correct? I have I I actually have IOMMU disabled right now. Okay. <laughs> so um, I managed to catch John Baldwin at UBSDCon between uh, talks. Yes. And he just sighed deeply and uh, gave his opinion that the uh, IOMMU driver for AMD systems just is not complete and does not properly work on modern hardware. And that FreeBSD needs to work on this and he hopes will work on it soon because we need it not just for PCI pass-through, but also to remap interrupts. So yeah, this, it's a known problem on modern AMD systems. When would one remap interrupts? So maybe to delegate it from one socket to the other in you know, oh, a big see. system. Oh, a bit like the pinning that John described? Forwarding interrupt requests in hardware. Got it. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, to balance load better, I assume, or to support systems with too many interrupts to handle on one interrupt controller. Maybe that's also a problem, especially with things like NVMe devices, where you suddenly have dozens or maybe even more uh, PCI devices. You can easily encounter problems like, oh no, you've run out of this kind of resource, ah. which was always fixed sized for any reasonable system because you would never have more than this number of PCI slots, right? I had that exact problem on an AMD system with 24 NVMe drives yeah. and the OS happened to load vmm.ko and the secret was to unload it and everything worked fine and half the drives showed up. It was... So the yes, other the half AMD... or only half? <laughs> Uh, initially, the, the other half, the missing half, did show up once we yeah. freed up some resources. That is good to know, and that shines some light on it. So uh, there wasn't time to go into details. Would have loved to, um, but yeah. Okay. Well, it's on his radar. That's that's key. He knows about it, but I don't know how much of a priority getting all of this fixed is. Got it. And one of the problems with working on it is that you can only develop and debug it on uh, bare metal and you have to have a bare metal kernel development setup where you have to expect lots of reboots and kernel panics during development. So, yeah. And to get all of the features worked out, you probably need this kind of access to a big system with lots of interesting hardware to play with, to exercise the drivers, to make sure that it actually works and not just that. Yeah, on my my eight core desktop, 
this worked with one PCI card. <laughs> uh, you're not wrong because I tried to do Santiago's test on a little Ryzen system and it worked just fine. And of course, you're, if you're mapping interrupts well, you might have multiple sockets. And why would you ever want that on a AMD with so many cores already? <laughs> Anyhow. Um, there are good reasons why you would want this, but... Even on a single socket system? I don't know about why you would want to have devices which have to be attached. Let's say you have your onboard uh, PCI connections to the NVMe drives. Mm -hmm. You may still want to have command and uh, response queues, uh, which to PCI devices connected on one socket, you probably still want to have the other socket have queues and send interrupts there so that okay. while you still have to move the data across the inter-socket link, you don't have to forward the interrupt handling and software or do all of the processing on one on another core or on another socket. And said it's probably better to have uh, the interrupts forwarded in hardware and just except that the device is accessed through an inter-socket connection. Oh. So that's... But that's just an assumption. Okay. Anything else on that topic? You get a few <clears throat> users with production workloads and hopefully <clears throat> yeah, lab together. And um, push it up in the priority list. That would be Santiago, and I have reached out to him to join this. I know he's been on a business trip, and so hopefully he can join. But he's the one with the lab and the problem. So he's, yes, that's the person you're referring to. Anyhow, uh, speaking of bugs, it sounds like Colin and Mark Johnson traced down a makefs-t uh, ZFS bug that's been Biting Colin thoroughly on AWS, and I now see it if I push a, a disk image to a hardware boot device. So Mark thinks he has it solved, and hopefully we see a fix soon. And from the broader political questions, uh, a recent FreeBSD quarterly status report mentions that the OpenBSD PF syntax is indeed being worked on. And there is a person with a first and a last name that I now have who is doing that work. So for everyone who's complaining about the PF syntax being out of date is slowly being synchronized. Interesting and domain. <laughs> Tuxpower.net. Yes, well, uh, he's, I don't know, seen the light. And if I'm not mistaken, Illumos, or no, Sono, uh, Sol, what do they call it now? Solaris, Oracle Solaris ships with OpenBSD PF. Has that made it into uh, Illumos? I'm not familiar with what this is. Okay. Um, so, go ahead, Jan. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, the Christoph type uh, commented words. on one of the first at UBSD Con, I think 2020. Uh, too, that yeah, the syntax may be nice, but customers, paying customers, that is, care more about throughput than uh, quality of life improvements. So if he gets the nice new syntax in, but but um, can only forward a tenth as many packets per second, he won't get uh, ha happy customers. But uh, yeah, so yeah, there's that. I'll put in a link for the Oracle EF, which I found out. Oh, the firewall. Also, the firewall. Also, oh, okay, now it is. Uh, Mac OS of all places. So that said, do you know if that's made it into uh, Illumos? And I'm not aware. Grab those links. Just because he posted them. So, Jan, those are the guilty files for the IOMMU issues. No, don't. I have the worst trackpad on the planet. <laughs> 
Okay. Let me log into a OmniOS host and see if one of the PF commands runs. It's just the last uh, useful part in the stack trace. Just okay. quickly. So, yeah. Maybe put a breakpoint on that and try it again and see. Step through the code until it crashes or something. If you have a kernel debugger with breakpoint support. Not. not super helpful, but here's someone in 2016 saying, hey, what are your thoughts about PF and Lumos? And that was that. I do not seem to have the PF packages quickly available in OmniOS, so I don't think so. Yeah, and it's pretty intrusive in the kernel, but I guess Oracle went to the trouble. If only Solaris were open source. Anyway, uh, looks like we will not be hearing from Goran or Santiago, which is just fine. Do, does anyone have other topics they want to address? Because I am happy to call it that. 1041 uh, Pacific. Go ahead. I, can I heard give a, a yes, short please. update. Yes. On uh, what I'm working with, but don't expect too quick uh, results. So, um, both in these calls as well as in the jails calls, one of the constant problems which come up is uh, state tracking. So that some part of the system knows about some state change, but has no good way to communicate that. But uh, the classic example for a jail would be a uh, non-persistent jail has died because the last process uh, has died. And so the kernel garbage collected the kernel part of the jail, but the state change is done to create the jail, like mounting a device file system and stuff like this, uh, and undone. So the, the next time you start the jail command, the file system state is out of sync with what it expects and it bails out. And now the user has to uh, undo this partial uh, state and start it again, which is quite annoying. There are lots of reports of people just giving up because they don't, they are not familiar enough with the internals of how it's implemented to recover to a, a same starting state. So instead, they just reboot the whole box and are frustrated understandably, I think, but um, for the, even for things where you get events, like for example, with DevD on FreeBSD, uh, the problem is that you can only consume an event once. So now your DevD configuration basically has to know about all the pieces of the system and all the consumers which want to be informed about an event, or you have to resort to polling, which isn't uh, really an acceptable solution. And um, so now my idea is to um, use a tempfs to basically put the state into files and then use file system state change notifications to get, I'm going through this slightly unusual way instead of starting a daemon because a daemon is something you have to start and which has to be available. And the file system is already um, jail aware. So, uh, and I've confirmed that this KQ uh, state notification works across nullfs mounts. Ah, so okay. we uh, would have a jail subdirectory available so that a jail could get controlled access to subtrees of the state. Uh, and of course, uh, user access control is already there as well. May not be the most efficient, but this is basically uh, an interface at more or less human speed than at full uh, system speed because it's uh -huh. for state uh, changes uh, and not so it should only be fast by human standards not by uh, network standards or stuff like that and uh, the the design constraints I've decided on are to never lose um, the notification that something changed, 
but do not preserve to not preserve the history. So you subscribe to a, a subset of possible events and you will never miss a notification that an event has occurred, but you will not get the history of how the system ended up here. So if you restart a virtual machine five times and then resume a consumer, it will only get told that this virtual machine state has changed, not that uh, at, at this time this happened, at this time this happened, because if you do that, so preserve this information, you have to keep an eternal log of all state changes. Um, and yeah, event sourcing systems have uh, unbounded storage requirements. Mm -hmm. uh, so you look at the tempfs directory, you see the current state, and you can act upon it. Yeah, and the other nice thing is that you can inspect the state just with your normal file system tools. Got it. So it's quite friendly for existing consumers. Is that currently just a bunch of post-it notes and napkins? Uh, it's a uh, non-compiling C code okay. uh, in the <laughs> basically uh, the syntax for matching I stole from MQTT. So you can wildcard on a path element, a directory, basically have a, a prefix of some number of directories, and you can. And at this level, I want to have a wildcard, and you can wildcard at the end. Um, yeah, that's easy to implement, easy to parse, and if you have the and it encourages nesting at the relevant parts instead of trying to embed structure into file names, you use a directory for each level of structure, mm -hmm. which is a lot cleaner uh, than later having to uh, to uh, apply complex rules because the structure then has to be basically we added from the outside. And I've seen it this as expressive enough for MQTT applications, which are, are quite complicated. Mm -hmm. So I hope that it works well and it's easy to communicate to a user that if you have a plus between two slashes in your path, that's a wildcard at this level. If the pattern ends in a hash, it's a suffix wildcard. So there has to be this level, anything, and then optionally something after that. Okay. Any questions for Jan? John, especially. Any observations? Does this ring a bell on things you've used? So, Any design concerns? If you were asking me, my immediate answer was is no, but I probably need to think about some of this. Cool. And Jan's been diligently you know, vocalizing this and making progress. So, so I guess yeah. just tune in next week for an update. I want to make it possible for multiple loosely coupled components to exist and react uh, without polling. And yeah, don't force too much policy on someone. Just be the mechanism. Uh -huh. Provide a mechanism and then hope that people will pick it up. Cool. Thank you. Anything else? I've got my finger on the adjournment button, but I am here to hear what you have to say. Keep you talking. I have another meeting, so I'm going to go ahead and go. Cool. See you guys. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, um, watch the recordings and have a great rest of your week and weekend. I appreciate it. Thank you. Always Bye. a pleasure.